pictured with her. So thankful. She called me yesterday and said she was going to get back. She did. Amen. The Lord is faithful. And uh, he's a good God. He supplies our needs. We live by faith. Everything that you give in the offerings that is given to us, we are responsible for that. We'll stand before God and give an account right. for the way we handle that or what we do with that. So uh, we appreciate your giving. And uh, we've had some criticism about our motor home. And uh, people just act like, you know, that we weren't supposed to be blessed with that. But uh, I just told them, you know, you haven't slept in the backseat of cars and on park benches and under tents. And cooked on a hibachi grill for nine crew members trying to preach a gospel. You don't know what we've been through to get to where we are right now. So uh, I thank you for buying the books and the Bibles and the Bible covers, all of that. We don't make a whole lot of money on them, but they do help us get gas and travel. And uh, we are full time. Uh, we, we work constantly. I put out over 300 newsletters every month by myself. Fold them, stuff them, print them, type them. I do the whole thing with Ernie's help, of course. And if he's not busy outside mowing grass on the property and trying to keep the church grounds looking good. Amen. We don't have church there anymore. We uh, closed our church uh, the 28th of July, 2021. We lost seven members in the pandemic. And we had two killed in a car wreck right before the pandemic. And so we were down to like five or six people. We have a 15,000 square foot building. And you put five or six people in there and you're lost. So uh, we just prayed about it. And Brother Ernie's going to be 85 in October. And uh, we wanted to spend the last five or six years that we have strength uh, on the road to preaching the gospel. Evangelism is in our heart. We're missionaries. We go to 13 different foreign countries. And preach the gospel. And uh, we've been to India. Brother Ernie's been 13 times to India. And I've been four times. And we've been to Trinidad. We're building a church right now in Trinidad. The Lord is helping us. We're going to Uganda in October. Um, first trip there. But we're excited about it. And uh, plan on going with a group from Greer, South Carolina. And uh, he sent pictures back today of of the meeting they're having over there right now. And boy, I just wanted to go. Amen. It just looks so wonderful how they were shouting and leaping and praising God and worshiping God. And, uh, you know, they're, they're wonderful people. They love the Lord. And uh, so we're, uh, we're just traveling, working for God. And I really don't say a whole lot about offerings and money, but I just want to thank you before I go. I know after I preach, I won't, for, I won't think of it. So I want, I want to tell you before I preach, we appreciate the meal that uh, Brother Glenn bought us today and also the one Brother David, Sister Liz, and the food you brought. What a blessing. Brother came by a while ago and brought us some steak. How you like that? Amen. We're appreciative of that. We, we very seldom eat that. And especially since prices have went out the roof, we just don't even look at it. We just pass on by and uh, every once in a while, we get a treat, and I thank God for that, and bacon and all that stuff that uh, Sister Michelle brought. We appreciate everything, and Sister Selena. My, it's been such a pleasure meeting all the new ones and getting acquainted with some better acquainted. And I just want to say thank you from my heart. Yes, Lord. And to pray for us. If you run out of something to pray for, you can pray for us. Yes. Because we'll be on the road somewhere. We've booked up all the way through the month of June. And uh, do have a little loose time in July. But I'll probably have that booked up probably before we get back home. So uh, let's just uh, really pray for one another. Lift one another up. And I want to talk to you tonight about where our nation is. And where the church is. Uh, my, my two concerns. Uh, my number one concern is for the church. I love the church. I, I've been a part of the Pentecostal movement since I was a little girl. My dad got saved when I was seven. And from then on, it was church, church, and more church. I never have got out of church. I'm not saying I've been perfect or didn't make mistakes, but I always loved going to church. I couldn't stand it if I couldn't go to church. I love to go to God's house. And sister said, this is the best place to be. 
Somebody said, I'd rather be here than in the jailhouse. I said, I'd rather be here than anywhere. Right. Amen. I love to be with the people of God. And the second concern I have is for the nation. Because my children are coming up in this nation. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren are coming up in this nation. Yes. And I see so much, so many things that are happening uh, another mass shooting last night in Texas. Uh, uh, just terrible things happening. And uh, I was reading some notes that I wrote, um, what, four weeks ago I wrote some notes about the mass shootings. Well, it's already topped all of that. I had to change my notes all around. So I already went up past that, what I had written down concerning the mass shootings that have happened. We've already had several since then. And I think someone said the other day, it's averaging out to be 1.4 per day, per day, mass shootings in America. We are in a dangerous time. Yeah. It's dangerous right to go anywhere, to associate with anything yes. outside of your home, because, and even in your home, you're not safe. Right. Because there's so much going on in the world, so much wickedness and evil. And uh, the caption over in the book of Amos, I'm going to give you a minute to find that. Uh, the caption there, it, it's talking about, in, in the passage that I'm going to read out of, it's talking about uh, Israel's failure to return to God. What was that song Sister Sue sang a while ago? All I'm asking you to do is turn around. That's all God ever asks of us is just turn around. And repent and get right with him. Amos chapter 4. And I'm just going to read one verse. Verse 7. And that whole passage there. From, chapter, from verse 4 all the way down to verse 13. Is talking about God's pleas to Israel. To repent. To turn around. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Let's read this verse. And also I have withholden. This is God talking to Israel. I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. Yes. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. Let's read one more. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water. But they were not satisfied. Yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Father, we ask you to bless this message tonight. Give me the strength in my body, Lord, to preach this message. Anoint us with fresh oil. Bless this church. Bless the people who go here. Bless every family. Bless every child, God, every parent, every grandparent. Touch the pastor, God, move for them, touch them, and bless them with healing, victory, and deliverance. God, we thank you for it. Bless their upcoming tent meeting. I pray that souls would be gathered in and there would be a harvest of souls that would come in, God, in this tent meeting. We thank you for a people, God, that love to worship you. So bless us tonight and encourage us to keep looking up and trusting and believing in you, Jesus. We ask it in your holy name. Yes. Amen, amen and amen. Amen. Um, you can be seated. I, I just want to talk a little bit about Amos. I've been in the book of Amos now for about three or four weeks. And uh, God has just led me into his prophecies are unique. Uh, they're not uh, real educated. Like Isaiah was a very educated prophet. Uh, Jeremiah was called from his mother's womb. Before he was even formed in the womb, God called him. But Amos kind of came on the scene. Um, he was just, I'll share that a little bit with you in a, in a minute. But he, he was just obscure in that he didn't have a lot of pretty words to say. He just, what do we call it, Brother Ernie? We, um, Brother Ernie says, I preach by the letter. I just open my mouth and let her fly. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but that's kind of the way Amos was. Yeah. And Amos wrote nine chapters, 146 verses of warnings to Israel yes. as a nation. I want you to see here that 
God uh, loved Israel. They were his chosen people. But God loves America too. God loves the United States. And, and he does include all nations in his prophetic warnings. He said the wicked shall be turned into hell. And all nations that forget God. Not just Israel. He wasn't just speaking there to Israel. He said blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And friends, it takes more than having it written on our coins to be uh, uh, to say that He is our God. Am I right? I mean, you can write it all over your coins, but if you don't put Him first, Amen, amen and, and give Him the honor that He deserves, it's just a saying on a coin. It's, it don't, it's not worth nothing. So blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And Amos come along and was ministering to Israel. But I want us to put America in here and see what we can get out of this. He's called a minor prophet by Bible scholars and commentators. But he said some major things about God and about how God feels about sin and rebellion and transgression against his word. And, and as I said a while ago, Amos was born... <laughs> In obscurity in a little town south of Jerusalem called Tekoa. Now I preach in a town called Tekoa, Georgia. But this was Tekoa in Israel just south of Jerusalem. He was called by God. And he himself declared that he was, what I preached this morning, a most unlikely candidate. He was somebody that didn't ever think that he would ever have a position as a prophet in Israel. And Amos 7, the high ups tried to shut him up. Yeah. If you read that chapter, uh, you'll find that he was proclaiming the word of the Lord in Bethel. And Jeroboam was a maker and worshiper of idols. He was the king in Israel at the time. And Amos was telling the truth about his wickedness. Yeah. He was reading his mail, in other words. And, and um, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, he came to Amos in Amos 7 and 12, and he said, you just need to get on out of here. We don't need your correction. We don't need your instruction. We don't need you to prophesy to us. Go down to Judah and prophesy. They need it a whole lot worse than we do. I mean, no, that's a lot of people's problem. They always see everybody else's faults, but they can't see their own. And, and, and he said, uh, this is the king's chapel. This is the main hub of the nation. And this is the Washington, D.C. of Israel. And we don't want you prophesying here. Get out of here. We're, we're not in need of your correction and your instruction. And I love Amos' reply in Amos uh, seven fourteen. Then answered Amos to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. But I was a herdsman and a keeper of sheep. And besides that, I was a picker of sycamore fruit. I worked in the sycamore orchards and I picked sycamore fruit, gathering the fruit in from harvest. In verse 15, and he said, And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And he said, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Yeah. Then went and he went right on for two more chapters after that. He didn't shut him up. He didn't make him be quiet. He just kept on prophesying. If you're a duck, you're going to quack. And if you're a prophet, you're going to prophesy. Am I right about it? Amen. I, I'm sure that he said a lot more that are recorded. It's recorded in the archives of heaven. Amen. But we have these nine chapters and 146 verses of what our generation calls doom and gloom preaching. Doom and gloom. How many ever heard that phrase? Doom and gloom. Well, you're just a doomer and a gloomer. All you have is bad news. Uh, amen. And but verse uh, chapter one and verse two, uh, it says that God was getting ready to roar out of Zion. Yeah. Roar. Everybody, listen to me tonight. He was going to roar out of Zion. And I, I'm sure that Amos was not whispering when he walked through the land, prophesying and preaching. I, I don't think he was. Uh, keeping his mouth muffled and trying not to make too much noise. No, no sir. Amen. There were no sound systems there. There were no cordless mics. Thank God for cordless mics. I don't know how many times I almost fell down over cords. Amen. With my heels on trying to preach the gospel. So thank God for cordless mics. But A Amos didn't have any. 
He didn't have an amplifier or a bullhorn. God just gave him words to say. And when he opened his mouth, they come out like a trumpet blast. Amen. They were loud and they were boisterous and, and forceful. Amen. In Amos 3 and 8, the prophet said, I've heard the lion roar. I fear this God. He has spoken. And how can I be quiet? <laughs> Lord have mercy. I may read that again. He said, I fear this God. I've heard the lion roar. And he has spoken, and how can I be quiet? Yes. We can't afford to shut up. This is the day we need to preach like we've never preached before. We can't afford to be quiet. We can't afford to muffle our words or look around for people's approval. Amen. We must preach the word of God. I think that God told Isaiah, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Israel their sins. Amen. I, I've been accused of being too loud. And if I'm too loud tonight, Brother Dave can cut me down. Amen. But I'm not going to be quiet when it comes to telling people how to live. Amen. I, I, I believe in meddling in people's business when it comes to sin. Come on, somebody. I, I believe, amen, that we've been too shy. Amen. We've been too backward. We've been too um, loose with uh, with things and uh, to to uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but we've tolerated sin and we put up with sin too long. And it's time to tell people you're either going to get right or you're going to get left. Come on, somebody. You're either going to get right or you ain't going in the rapture. Because there won't be no sin there. And how many believe Jesus is coming soon? And he's knocking on the door already. I feel the Holy Ghost coming in here. Now, in chapter 4, he re the Amos reproved Israel for three things. There were three things here. And I would have read the whole thing to you, but to save time, just let me share these three things. Number one, he, he reproved them for oppression of the poor and the needy. Amen. And God help a nation who loves the rich and lifts up the rich and sings the praises of the rich. Amen. But they put the poor down and ignore the poor and their needs. Lord help a nation. Amen. That praises the rich and puts the poor down. Now I ought to get three amens on that. And then they were reproved for their lack of repentance. When God chastened them, there's nothing, amen, uh, in there about them repenting. Matter of fact, the Bible said they refused to return. And there's nothing that moves the heart of God like repentance, brokenness, and humble submission and admission of sin and failure. Amen. God despises pride. Am I right about it? James 4 and 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. James was quoting the proverb of Solomon from Proverbs 3.34. Peter wrote it again in 1 Peter 5 and 5. So three times here, amen, God said he respects humble repentance more than proud justification. Come on, somebody. Israel was not only sinning against God, they were proud they were sinning against God. They were flaunting their sin in the face of God. And somebody said on Facebook the other day, I'd rather deal with a failure that makes me humble than a success that makes me proud. Come on, somebody ought to grab a hold of that. <laughs> I'd rather deal with a failure that humbles me more than a success that makes me proud. Amen. So God hates pride. And Israel were flaunting this sin in the face of God. And number three, Amos reproved them for their idolatry or the worshiping of false gods. God is very sensitive about allegiance and loyalty and devotion especially in worship. Amen. He loves for us to center in on Him and worship Him. Amen. And Exodus 23, uh, the commandment said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. You see, God was angry because in 2 Kings chapter 12, 
when Amos, this is in, during Amos time, King Jeroboam had built two golden calves and declared to the people, this is what he said in 2 Kings 12, he said there's no need to look toward Jerusalem and don't go to Jerusalem to worship. That's too far. That's too long a journey. He said, look to the gods that I have built you and worship these gods here at home. And, and, and you know, that's just really saying in our language, uh, uh, stay away from church. Uh, stay at home. Uh, take the easy route. Uh, amen. Grab your cereal. Set your pajamas in your recliner. And, and, and watch somebody preaching on TV or Facebook. Book and let the house of God close up and suffer and be neglected because nobody wants to come. Jeroboam not only changed who they worship, but he changed where they worship. Let me tell you, it's important who you worship and it's important where you worship. If the Spirit of God is not there, you need to pack your bags and get out of there. If the liberty of the Holy Ghost is not there, if they're not preaching against sin, if they're letting sin go on, amen, then you need to get out of there. You don't need to be there. And so uh, what happened was, because Jeroboam did this, the corporate anointing was lost in Israel. The unity and the togetherness of the people was gone. Amen. And that corporate anointing occurs when we all get together. Amen. And worship God in spirit and in truth. And 1 Kings 12, it says he ordained priests. He built altars. He had singers. He had celebrations. He had feasts. But it led Israel into the sin of idolatry. Amen. Because 1 Kings 1233 says he devised this method in his own heart. In other words, it was man-made worship. It was entertainment. Amen. It wasn't godly worship. It was flesh-oriented. It was humanistically designed to cater to their flesh and not give glory and honor unto God. Hallelujah. I wouldn't give you a dime for somebody shouting and dancing if they don't live right when they hit the Ground. Come on, somebody. It ain't about how high you jump. It's about how right you walk when you hit the floor. Amen. What happened because of this is, is God began to withhold the rain from them. Now, rain always represents the blessings of God. Amen. Showers of blessings are talked about in the Scripture. And God began to withhold His blessings from the nation. The people was angry with Amos. But Amos wasn't the problem. Amos was the solution. They were the problem. Yeah. Amen. Amos 4.13. It says he was proclaiming the Lord, the God of hosts, the name of the one who created the wind and reveals men's thoughts. That's why they didn't like him. Amen. He was reading their mail. Come on, somebody. He was telling people, amen, Jeroboam's not of God. He's not right with God. In Amos 4, 7, God said, I have withheld, I have withheld the rain from you. And then God explains. He said, I sent the rain on one city. I rained here and I rained there. And verse 8, he said, because of that, the city that God rained on was inundated with visitors who were thirsty. But when they got there, they drank of the water and it didn't satisfy them. They, they got it, but they got a touch. But the thing about it was they went home just like they came. It didn't change their life. In verse 8 again, yet in all of that you did not return to me. In other words, there was no repentance individually or corporately in the nation. There was no repentance among the people. Hey, it don't do no good to go to a revival if you don't let that word of God change you and get down into your heart. A so-called move of God that is lacking in repentance is not a true revival. Amen. Revival happens when the saints get revived and when sinners repent. Come on, somebody. Revival can be 
It can be called all kinds of things. But the only thing that constitutes a true revival is repentance. Amen. The reason we're seeing these outbreaks in Asbury, Kentucky, and Cleveland, Tennessee, and all down in Brownsville, Florida, and all around. Amen. There are outbreaks in different locations in our nation. It's because of the showers have been withheld, and people are thirsty, and it's for the same reasons that God gave to Amos. Uh, idolatry, oppression of the poor, and most of all, a lack of repentance, uh, amen, among the people. Lack of response when God chastens uh, and reproves them. God said, I'm not going to rain my showers uh, on those uh, who just get wet that don't change. Come on now. I'm not going to rain on nobody, amen, that just gets a little shower and they like that little feeling and they like that little hype they get, but they go home as big a mess as they was when they come in the door. Amen. You can wander to this city, to that city. You can go to that revival and this revival and you can go here and you can go there, but the water you get will not satisfy you unless there is two true repentance. Amen. In your inner man. Come on, let's lift our heads and say thank God for the peace. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. Come on, wave your hand and say, God, we need the rain. God, we need the rain, Lord. We need the rain of conviction. I said we need the rain of conviction on our lives. In Amos 4, God named five disasters, five calamities. Famines, pestilence, plagues, fires, and floods. Yeah. And still they wouldn't repent. Right. And see, God's intention. Everybody say intention. intention. God's intention in allowing these hard times was to drive the people to repentance. Yeah. That's what he was trying to do. He was shaking them to get their attention. Yeah. And you see, it does little or no good for God to send these things upon the people who refuse to understand the implications or the source of the disaster is God trying to shake the nation. And one key to understanding a national disaster is we have to see that God orders everything. God is in control. Romans 13 and 1 says there is no powers that be unless God ordained them and orchestrates them. Amen. The only way a disaster can change a nation or a person is if they understand that it was God who sent it. And if you say in our nation, if you say that these things are the judgment of God, they'll ride you out of town on a rail, honey. Amen. They'll crucify you. Listen to me. Let's get down to some things here. 9-11 happened September 11th. 2001, over 21 and a half years ago. Amen. The churches opened. War was pending. People everywhere were praying. There was on every sign. They were gathering in the churches. The U.S. was groaning under the killing of almost 3,500 Americans in a few moments' time. Sad to say, just a few months down the road, Saddam Hussein became a household name and God was left out of the picture. Oh no, this didn't have nothing to do with God. This was Saddam Hussein. No one woke up to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, 9-11 took place to invoke repentance in the nation. And God was giving us a chance, amen, to see that in a split second, our lives can be snapped out and taken out. Oh God, leaders and generals and presidents and governors uh, reeled under the knowledge uh, that four airplanes and 19 Muslim men had destroyed the most expensive armed uh, and protected buildings uh, on our shores uh, and killed almost 3,500 people, not to mention the thousands uh, that have died from breathing in the jet fuel. Amen. When they tried to flee the city. Uh, amen. I'm talking about the city where the Statue of Liberty stands. And has welcomed visitors from all over the world, from every nation in the world. But another sad truth is that these visitors have brought their gods with them. They brought their false religions with them. Amen. And in 2022, there were over 3,000 mosques that have built to go in and worship Allah. And we've got our minds off the truth and the living God. Oh, God, help America. Oh, God, help our nation. Come on, brace your hands and cry out for that nation tonight. 
right. Amen. 22 years have come and gone since that day. Amen. We, have the, we see the proof that God has withheld the showers. The churches are dead and dry. Amen. In the past 20 years, statistics say that tornadoes and storms have increased by 40%. But God is not mentioned in those reports. That don't got nothing to do, to do with God. Oh no, that's global warming. Amen. Well, could I just say tonight, it might be a little bit of global warming, but I'm going to tell you it's God trying to get a hold of the cities in this nation and shake them for their gambling casinos. Amen. And their house of prostitution. God is trying to shake them. Amen. And wake them up and get them to come clean. In 1962, one woman raised her ugly voice and our Supreme Court banned public prayer in the public school and deemed prayer unconstitutional. Imagine that. And then on April 20th, 1999, two students shot 12 kids and one teacher in Columbine, Colorado. And if a bomb had went off that they had placed, it would have killed almost everybody in that school. Since 1999, there have been more than 400 school shootings and millions of our little children have been exposed to gun violence and bloodshed. Amen stuff they used to watch on TV is now live and in color right in their very classroom. Amen. In the land of the free and the home of the brave, I want to tell you we have seen trouble on every side. Since 1999 and 2022 through 2022, amen, we have seen mass shootings. Over 194 mass shootings have went on this year in the United States. In the month of April alone, in 15 days, there was 23 mass shootings in America. And who gets the blame? Who's, who is causing all of this? Is God even considered? No, it's the the guns, they say. It's the guns. That's the gun. It's shooting itself. Amen. It ain't got nobody behind it. Come on, y'all looking at me strange here. I'm not a gun advocate, but I'm going to tell you, amen, it ain't the gun. It's sin. That's what causes it. It's sin. It's wickedness. Amen. And, and see, they don't attribute it to the vile depravity in the hearts of the people. And our leaders are so godless. <laughs> Amen. They never admit that the showers have been withheld because of their own wickedness. Change the laws, they say. Just make another law. Just put another law in place. And honey, you can write it all day long. Thou shalt not shoot thy neighbor. And if thy neighbor gets ready to shoot thee, he will shoot thee. Come on, somebody. Amen. A law don't mean nothing. That's a bunch of humbug. It's not laws that need changing. It's the hearts of men and women. It's the hearts of Americans. Amen. We have, we have shook our fist in the face of God. And we have defied His convicting power. They kicked prayer out of school and violence took its place. They banned the Ten Commandments from the courthouse and crime increased. June the 26th, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court granted same-sex couples uh, the right to marry. Uh, now in 2023, our classrooms are filled with drag queens uh, and transgenders uh, and idiots getting up in front of our children half-naked, amen, but uh, purporting some kind uh, of, uh, of an alternate lifestyle which ain't nothing in the world but demon possession. That's what the Bahasa is perversion. It's perversion. Amen. They're teaching our children. They ain't teaching them reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. No, they're teaching them to be cats and dogs. Come on, somebody. They're teaching them to deny their own gender and their own birth. Amen. And God is not seen, amen, as God anymore. Oh, Lord. They don't trust God anymore. They're shaking their fist in God's face. Amen. He sent a pandemic across the world in 2019. And in the U.S. alone, 1,158,000 deaths are attributed, amen, to the coronavirus. But no, it wasn't God that done that. It was China. 
It was China that done that. Oh yeah. Amen. Well the bat may have originated in Wuhan, China but the plan to get people's attention originated at the throne of God. Amen. God said I'm going to shake the nation. Amen. Has it changed anything? No. No. Apparently not much because the churches are emptier now than they've ever been. Come on, Tell the truth. Preach it. Amen. In the history of the church, the churches have never been this empty. The showers have been withholding. You say we want revival. Well, God wants to pour it out on us more than we want it. But He's not going to waste His water on nobody. Come on now. He's pouring His showers out on people who's got their umbrella up. Come on, put that umbrella up there, Brother Ernie. Amen. They'll come in church saying, oh, God, rain on us. Rain on us, God, rain on us. But they brought their umbrella to church, and they got it up over their head. Well, God, I'd really like you to send a shower, but, Lord, you know, I might get wet, so I'm going to go ahead and put my umbrella up. Amen. What you need to do is take that thing down, honey. Amen. And say, soak me, God. Soak me, God. Wet me, God. Soak me, God, until I'm soaking wet. Until I'm so convicted that I can't do nothing without being convicted. Come on, you ought to shout and give God praise. Amen. Amen. In my 75 plus years, I have never witnessed such a lack of shame for sin. There's no shame for evil and wickedness. Jeremiah 3 and 3, the prophet said, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there has been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. This was Jeremiah's reminder preached shortly before the fall and the scattering of God's people to Babylon. In those days, Bible history reveals that God's people were living in wealth, unblinkingly wallowing in pleasure and sin. They were focused on fulfilling every selfish desire of their Adamic nature. They gave little or no thought to God and were totally blinded to the moral depravity that was all around him. Shame for sin had disappeared in Israel. And the phrase, a harlot's forehead, is referring to the symbolism or the attire of a harlot. She's so desensitized to her sin that she proudly decorates her forehead amen with some kind of a symbol of her profession she wants everybody to know that she sleeps with anybody and everybody and she's for hire and she'll lay down with dogs if necessary amen to fulfill herself she is totally oblivious to the dangers that she is in or that she is causing her sense of right and wrong is dead she has no feeling. Amen. The Bible said when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Amen. And worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. Amen. Sin no longer is causing them to blush or try to hide her deeds. Amen. Before the 50s and 60s, I know I lived in those days. Amen. There was a sense of shame about moral failure back in those days. Amen. Amen. When people fell into sin, amen, they, they, they still wanted to hide. They didn't want nobody to know they was living. Amen. All of U.S. citizens practically expressed a strong sense of shame when they fell into sin. But in 1964, the Beatles came to America. Amen. The Beatles hit our shores. Amen. And women started stripping off their clothes. Right in public, falling down and worshiping these long-haired bunch of junk. Amen. They were singing to them and banging on a guitar and a drum. Ringo Starr become more popular than Jesus Christ. John Lennon became more popular than Jesus Christ. And people were unashamedly, amen, crawling into their concerts and stripping their clothes off. And girls were fainting and dying at their feet. Listen to me church it started then and since that day it has escalated it has went up and up and up until now people know more about sports stars than they do about the bible they can't tell you 
the 12 disciples uh, that they can tell you who, play, who plays for the L.A. Lakers. Come on, somebody. Amen. Lift your hand if you love the truth. I love it. Amen. You can't freeze me. I've been to Canada. Amen. Amen. I lived back in them days. I lived in the 50s and 60s. I was born in 1947. Amen. And back when I was a child, if you done wrong, you told a lie. Amen. You got punished for that. Amen. You didn't smart off to your teacher. Amen. Your parents were free to punish you, to discipline you, and to tell you what right and wrong was. And don't get me wrong, some of that still exists. But since 1964, the beginning of the end of all shame in our nation started. And since then, sin has gradually lost its stigma. And a sense of shame has been slowly replaced by a growing bond attitude about sin. They'll shit sin right in your face. Amen. They'll get right in your face with their immorality. It's a way of life. Rudeness, road rage, and rape are rampant in our country. Every three minutes a woman is raped in this nation. Amen. We are living in times and a lot of them are raped because they won't put no clothes on when they go outside. Come on somebody. They flaunt nudity. They on immorality, they flaunt adultery, amen, we got preachers, pastors, and churches who shacked up with people they ain't even married to help me Jesus amen, this is a symbolic meaning here, the whore's forehead, yes. Jeremiah 8 and 12 were they ashamed when they committed abomination, no they were not at all ashamed, no. neither could they blush no. <laughs> they couldn't even blush, they were doing all this stuff and wasn't even ashamed of it this saying signifies a relaxed and careless disregard for God's warning in Scripture about sin. The showers won't come until we have a revival of repentance. It's not going to come. You can shout loud. You can sing good. You can turn people's tears on singing about your loved ones that died and went on to heaven. You can evoke emotionalism in people's lives. But until there's true repentance, there's not going to be a real revival in this nation. I believe there's one coming, but I believe it's going to take a repentance. We're going to have to turn around from our wicked ways. And we're going to have to seek God. Can we lift our hands right before I close and let's just praise the Lord here. Amen. I'm not going to leave you hanging here with no hope. I didn't tell you all this to make you feel hopeless. It's not hopeless. Jesus said, I'll build my church upon the rock and the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. And Solomon said, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He said, I will hear from heaven and I will heal the land. That's my hope. Amen. That's what I want to see. Amen. I can't leave us hanging here with no hope. I have to share the good news is that I can have my own walk with God. I can have my own personal relationship with God. I don't have to wait for the nation to repent. I can repent. I don't have to wait for the church to get right. I can get right. I don't have to wait for you to worship God. I can worship God. I don't have to look around to see if you, 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 or you are doing anything. I can have my own personal revival and my own personal worship. Amen. This is... This is up to me as an individual. I can repent. I can keep my shame for sin turned up to where conviction is a part of my everyday life. Amen. I can't go for days and days and days and, and, and yell at my husband and throw a book if I get mad and all this stuff and just tiptoe on through the tulips like I didn't do nothing. I have to get down and ask God to forgive me. Come on now. I don't know about y'all, but I have to get down and weep and cry and say, Lord, I failed you. I'm a mess. I need you to help me. Amen. And I'd rather do that than to go on with my old head up in the air acting like I'm Miss Perfect. Come on, somebody. Because he resists the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Amen. I believe I can move in conviction. Revelation 3.20 is my hope. Jesus said to the lukewarm backslid church at Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door. Behold, I stand at the door. Do you hear it knocking? 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then the next line says, if any man. Oh, it didn't say the whole church. Just one individual in that church can be sensitive to the knock at the door. And you know, if someone knocked physically back there, amen, we'd all hear it just about. Amen. But if someone is knocking spiritually, there's only a few that's tuned their ear to hear that knock at the door. But Jesus said, if any man hear my voice and open the door. Notice the door opens from the inside. He's not going to force his way in through that door. That door's got a handle on it. And you've got to open that door if you want Jesus to come in. He said, you'll open the door and hear my voice. I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. That word sup means to dine with. It means to come in and sit down and share a meal with. Amen. Not just a snack. But the principal meal. Amen. This means I can have my showers. Amen. This means God will care for me. Just one. If I'm the only one left in the church that wants God, He'll still come by and knock on the door. Am I right about it? Amen. You say, will God move for just a few? Well, why don't you ask Lot who came out of Sodom. When God heard Abraham's prayer and he started with 50 and got all the way down to 10 and finally only four come out and one looked back and became a pillar of salt. But God saved three people out of a city of millions because Abraham prayed. Your prayers mean something to God. The affection fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Ezekiel 34 26 God promised and I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing and I will cause the showers to come down in his season and there shall be showers of blessings. Amen. But you got to get your umbrella down. The phrase round about my hill is referring to Zion, the church. Amen. Them means those who continue on carrying the torch for the church Jesus purchased with his own blood. The wickedness of the world around me cannot stop my showers. I can get my rain in my season. Amen. When everyone else is dry, dusty, dead, and disgusted, I can feel the rain. Amen. I can feel the rain. (laughs) Amen. It'll rain at my house. (laughs) Amen. They may put their umbrella up, but I got mine down. I want the rain. (laughs) March 29th, 1969, I became a new bottle. And God poured new wine in me. (laughs) And as long as I repent the chastings of my father, when he comes at me with those chastings, uh, amen, then he calls me a son. (laughs) Am I right about it? If you don't want no chasing, you're not a son. You are an illegitimate child. You don't belong in the family of God if you won't take the chastening rod. If you want the showers to return to your dry parched soul, you need to search your heart right now. You need to repent of anything in your life that is not right. Ask God to turn up your thermostat of conviction. We need more sensitivity. Where sin's concerned. That's right. We excuse sin. Come on, Come on now. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we went to a pastor's home not too long ago. And, and they was watching this movie. And there was all kind of cussing and, and four letter words. And I got up and left the room. And the lady come out and said, why did you leave? I said, I don't listen to that kind of language. She said, what do you mean? I didn't hear anything. I thought, man, something wrong with you. Amen. You need to go back and listen again. Come on now. No, on the other hand, you need to throw that thing in the garbage because it ain't fit to watch. Come on, somebody. We have lost our sensitivity to sin. We have become desensitized to sin. The love of money is the root of all evil. And this is the most money-loving generation I've ever seen in my life. They'll kill you for two dollars. Am I right about it? Amen. We need to turn up our thermostat where conviction is concerned. I dare somebody bow your head right now and say, God, don't ever let me get desensitized. Don't ever let me get insensitive to my wrongdoings, God. 
Oh, God. Lord, if I've got anything in me, take it out. God, if there's anything that offends you, come on, pray, saints. I want you to pray for your very self right now. Nobody else. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I want you to pray for yourself right now. God, if I can just get right. Lord, if I can just stay right, God. Lord, if I can just keep my heart sensitive to when I do wrong. When I throw a temper tantrum and I tell a lie, I cheat and I do something that ought not be done. God, I want to be sensitive to that, Lord. Don't let me keep walking in that and go to hell over it, God. Please convict me, Lord. Please convict me, Lord. Please chasten me, Lord, about my sin. Please chasten me, Father, about my wrongdoing. Amen. Help me, Help me God. Let's stand all over the building. Amen. Just keep your heads bowed just for a minute. And I want us to humble our heart. The Bible says if my people will humble themselves. If you humble yourself, that means that you take the blame for stuff that you wasn't even responsible for. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks. That you take the blame for things that you didn't even do. You humble in your heart. And you say, God, I'd just rather get this under the blood. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the blame for it. Hold on, I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who that is. But you say, God, <laughs> they did this and that to me. And Lord, I want you to get them. I want you to punish them. But Lord, on the other hand, I'm just going to humble my heart before you. And I'm going to ask you to help me and forgive me. And God, I'll just take the blame. Lord, it was my fault. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have acted that way. Come on, let's confess. Let's confess right now to God. I dare somebody to open their mouth and confess. Lord, I am a miserable failure at times. There are times, Lord, when I should have prayed and I didn't pray. There are times when I should have read the Bible and I was too busy doing other things. God, I want to get away from social media and all the junk it gives me. And I want to get into the Word of God. Lord, forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me. Somebody say, God, forgive us. Come on, say it in concert. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. God, forgive the church. God, forgive our nation. God, forgive our president for the way way he's doing. God forgive them. God forgive our leaders for the way they're doing. God forgive the school system for the way it's allowing all this junk. God forgive our government for being so out of control that they have no respect for human life. God forgive the abortionists. God forgive us of our national sins of homosexuality and abortion and murder. God forgive us. Forgive us, forgive us. Come on, cry, saints. I want you to cry. I want to see somebody in here crying. I want to see somebody weeping before him. God. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. Give us a godly sorrow. Give us a sorrow of our heart tonight, God. Forgive us, Jesus. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. Forgive my neighbors, God. Forgive me for not being a better neighbor. Forgive me, Lord, for all the failures with my children and my family. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for not having a burden for the lost. Forgive me, Lord, for not having a burden for souls. God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for blaming my, my failures on everybody else. Forgive me, oh God. Wash me and cleanse me and help me, Jesus. Help me, Thank Jesus. You, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to wait just a minute. If you feel in your heart tonight that you need to come stand up here at this altar, just pray for the nation for about two, three minutes. And I would like you to get out of your seat and just walk up here. And I want you to pray. I want you to pray for the nation. I want to see a turnaround in our government. I want to tur see a turnaround. Oh, God. Oh, God. I want to see a turnaround. I want to see a turnaround. Come on, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Are you righteous tonight? Are you living right? Then get out of your seat and walk up here. And let's pray for this nation. Let's pray for this nation. Let's pray for the, this community. Let's pray for independence in Covington. Let's pray for Taylor Mill in Cincinnati. Let's pray tonight. Let's pray. Come on, pray, saints, pray. Come on, pray. I praise you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you will lose your
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 